patriarchs. A wail of woe ran through all of the sepulchers of the world. The Son of God lay dead there in the tomb, but Jesus had permitted himself to be taken captive by death that he might lead captivity captive. That's what Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 says. Now that's not that he went into hell, Tartarus, uh, to take captive captive. He didn't do that. Jesus said to the thief on the cross today, you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus went to paradise. So that's not what Ephesians 4 verse 8 is about. When Jesus Christ led captive captive, what he did was in his death he defeated Satan took the captives of Satan and made them his captives. He took lost sinners out of the kingdom of darkness and put them into his own kingdom of light, the church of our precious Lord, and now he's leading the church on to heaven. Amen. Those that love him and trust him, and that's what this passage is saying. That's what this author is writing about here, and he goes on to say, "In the Lord Jesus Christ, to the glory of God, had gone into that grave to undermine the foundations of death and to kindle the star of hope in the grave. We were bound up by death and the fear of it. Right. Until Jesus Christ came, the Lord Jesus Christ rose up then from the dead. The author says the Lord Jesus Christ took the sting from death. That's exactly what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 goes on to say. The Lord Jesus Christ took the crown from death and broke that crown. Yeah. Now folks, that's the historical supernatural basis of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the proof of it, and also the proof that those who have died in Christ and those of us who will die in Christ will be raised and we will have life eternal Amen. through Him. Amen. I believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe it as literal as His first coming. And I believe, therefore, in my resurrection as real and as literal as His was. Mm -hmm. I believe just as He is alive, I will uh, continue to be alive. Now, as Paul makes this argument about the death, burial, and resurrection being proved for our resurrection, he uses those two little words. You can just underscore them in your text. Even so. Sometimes the smallest words uh, have the most powerful meaning, even so. Even so. What he's saying is if Christ was raised, you're going to be raised. Yeah. Now these, these Christians in uh, Thessalonica, they're grieving. They're grieving over their loved ones. Now the Lord's not saying that we shouldn't sorrow over losing our loved ones. Uh, in fact, the Apostle Paul made mention of uh, one of his companions and said that uh, had this person died that uh, he would have had sorrow on top of sorrow over it. He's not saying that we shouldn't grieve or have sorrow over loved ones that have passed. That's just something natural. But what he's saying is we should not sorrow over them. As those who have no hope, we have hope for them. Right. That they'll be raised at the Lord's coming. And that we'll see them again. And we'll be with them forever with the Lord in heaven. Now, that's the first evidence. And you know I'm not going to get done with this, don't you? We, we're coming up on uh, out of time already. Uh, I haven't even started. But the second great evidence here is the word of the Lord. He said, I'm saying this by the word of the Lord. The Lord himself uh, spoke over and over again of his coming. Just as Jesus spoke over and over again of the reality of hell so that when he died on the cross, people would know what his death actually meant. He spoke over and over again also of his coming again because he wants us to be looking and he wants us to be ready. And that's really the great thrust of this entire passage of Scripture. Christ's return is going to be secret according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in the sense that we don't know when he's coming. He may come tonight. He's coming as a thief. Uh, but when he, he does come, it will be final. Uh, just notice what 1 Corinthians 15, 23 and 24 again says, But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then it is coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. The end when he delivers up the kingdom, that's the church to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, and the last enemy is death. And Christ will also sit in judgment at this time over all the world. In Matthew 16, 27, the Bible says, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels, in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. 
That's why we need not be ignorant about the Lord's coming. We need to be learning about His coming and we need to be preparing for His coming lest His coming take us like a thief and we not be prepared. Now that's the first thing. Uh, listen, he's, he's talking about those who are in Christ. Those who are asleep in Christ, he says, and those that are His. That's where the hope here lies. Uh, all blessings, the Bible teaches, are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And those who are in Christ Jesus are those, according to Galatians 3, verse 26, that have been baptized into Him. They are the family of God. Being in Christ, they have redemption from their sins, and therefore now no condemnation. They have salvation with eternal joy. And as 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verse 14 and 16 says, Hope after uh, death is only in Christ. So folks, you want to be in Christ. Amen. So that this would apply to you and to me. Now here's the second thing that we want to know concerning Christ's coming. That is that we are to be comforted. We're to be comforted by Christ's coming. In other words, you can rest in it. Paul ends this passage in verse 18 again by saying, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now sometimes when we preach about the second coming like last night, we do it to frighten people. Uh, and we ought to be frightened uh, if we are in our sins, if we are not in Christ. In fact, we ought to be terrified. But this particular passage is written not to threaten, not to frighten. This is written to comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And what the apostle does here is he gives a scenario. He gives an outline of what's going to happen when the Lord comes and there are four basic events that lead to our great comfort. First of all, there's the majesty of His return. Now I want to tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself is the central figure of the Bible and of this passage and of this promise. In verse 16 it says, For the Lord, the Lord Himself shall descend. I love that. This is another argument against the realized eschatology doctrine. They believe that uh, Jesus came in judgment on Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Uh, it's a localized judgment. Uh, but that simply is not true because Jesus Christ himself is coming in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also that pierced him, and all the people of the earth will wail or mourn because of him. I love the fact that Jesus Christ himself, the one who shed his blood, in love for us. He's coming. Don't try to spiritualize this either. Don't try to explain this away. Just let it say what it says here. The Lord Himself will come. In Acts chapter 1 verse 11, the Bible says that this same Jesus which is taken up from you, this same Jesus that fed the 5,000, this same Jesus that uh, walked the dusty shores of uh, Galilee, this same Jesus that loved and had compassion and this same Jesus that suffered and died, He's coming in the same way that you've seen Him go. Sometimes people say, well, you know, the second coming of Jesus, well, that's kind of when you die and um, the Lord comes for your spirit you just go to heaven. Uh, but that's not the second coming. Not according to the Scriptures. Or some people say, well, the second coming of Jesus, that's kind of like when you're born again and He comes to live in your life. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, that's the new birth, and that's, that's absolutely necessary in order for a person to enter the kingdom of heaven and to have the promise of the Lord's coming and the resurrection and a home in heaven, but that still is not what the Bible is saying. The Bible says the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven. That's what the Bible says. There is uh, here the majesty of His return. One day our Lord is going to rise up off of His throne and He is going to step out from the lofty heights of heaven's splendor and He is going to be begin His descent to earth. The Lord shall descend. Yeah. That's terrifying if you're not a Christian. But oh, what a comfort that is to those of us that are serving Him and love Him Amen. and are giving our lives for Him. He's coming in the glory of the Father. He's coming with all the holy angels. And when we sing that song, Lord, haste the day when our faith shall be sighted. Don't you love that song? The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumpet shall sound. Our Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. 
So the very first thing, Jesus our Lord literally, actually, visibly is coming back. Just as real, just as certain as his first coming. He shall descend from heaven. And then also, uh, there's what you might call the miracle of his resurrection. Or of the, of the resurrection. We're going to be raised. Uh, notice again verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. And so here we understand um, there's going to be several sounds. Um, there's going to be the shout. I don't know exactly what that means. A lot of Bible scholars uh, think that, that uh, there's a prefigured text to go along with this. Uh, in John chapter 11, Jesus, or Lazarus had died and Jesus came about four days later. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And it may be that when Jesus comes, that will be the shout. I don't know. But I can tell you this. He's coming as the one who has authority. Right. All authority, both in heaven and and on earth. And there's also going to be the voice of the archangel. There's going to be the trump of God. Now let me tell you something. The Bible trumpets were very important to Israel in times past because they uh, sounded primarily two things. Number one, they sounded uh, a period of time for worship and a period of time of war. Now Jesus Christ is coming for those that love him, those who are in him, that they might be with him and worship him, but he's also coming in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. Right and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's kind of the outline of what's coming. And then again, the admonition. Therefore, encourage one another, build one another up, as chapter 5, verse 11 says. Just as you're doing. Comfort of His coming. And then here's the last thing. Concerning Christ's coming, we're to be changed. The fact that Jesus Christ could come back at any day, at any moment, that should absolutely change us. That should have a profound, transforming effect upon us and upon the way we live. We should not be living like everyone else is living in the world. Now, that's a pretty good place for an alien. Amen. And so he says here in chapter 5, he says here in chapter 5, let us, because of the of what he said in chapter 4, he goes on to say, let us do several things. Let us be affected in several ways. One of the uh, ways the Lord's return ought to change us is that it should call, cause us to watch with anticipation. Look here at verses 4 and 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter, or, uh, verses 4 through 6 of chapter 5. He says, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Now, Paul says here that we are not to sleep as others are sleeping. Now, there are people all around us that are absolutely asleep. They have no idea what's going on or what they are headed towards, but we're not in darkness. Amen. We have the Word of God. We have the light of the glorious gospel. We know what's coming. How foolish would it be for us to know what's coming and to live like the world is living? Amen. To think like the world is thinking. To talk like the world is talking. To do what the world is doing. Friend, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, a thief has three weapons. If a thief is going to come and be successful, uh, they want, number one, to use darkness. Yeah. They want to come at a uh, time when it's dark or maybe when the shades uh, are drawn or when nobody's home. And Paul says, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We're not of the night nor are we of the darkness. Unlike those who are in the world who are blinded by the God of this world, we are not in the dark. We have the light of God's Word, and it's a light for our path. It's a lamp for our feet, Psalm 119 says. We know Jesus is coming. Therefore, we're to walk in the light, the light of the revelation of God's Word. But not only do thieves use darkness, but they use dullness. A thief will come when people are in the bed at sleep. Uh, when they're just not uh, on guard. Uh, when they don't know he's coming, right? I mean, if you knew he was coming, you'd sit up and wait on him, wouldn't you? 
Uh, you turn the lights on, wouldn't you? But what Paul was saying here is that there are some who are going to be overtaken by the Lord's coming like a thief would overtake people who are uh, in the bed asleep like they don't know that he's coming. And not only do they, does a thief use uh, darkness, not only does the thief use dullness, but a thief uses drunkenness. Paul, Paul uses that as an illustration here. So often people are partying at night, aren't they? And they're drinking. It'd be so easy to slip into some of these people's homes at night on a Friday night. These people are out drinking and uh, doing those kinds of things. And Paul says in verse 7, For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But he says we're to be sober. Yeah. Let me tell you something. For those of our brethren who want to argue for the cause of social drinking, let me tell you what the Bible says about that. Sober. Right. Sober. Amen. And some people say, well, you know what, man? Uh, we're just not supposed to get drunk. No, we're supposed to be sober. Right. Yeah. That's what the Bible teaches. Amen. We're to be sober. We're to be alert. We're to be watching. We're not to be like the world. Satan wants us to be chloroformed with his, uh, with, with his wine. He does not want us to be alert. alert. The New Testament writers, though they are all eagerly waiting for Jesus to come back, you can't read one of the books of the Bible without almost getting the impression that these guys, uh, these writers, uh, under the uh, revelation of the Holy Spirit, that they're just standing tiptoed, looking for the Lord to come at any moment. They are so eagerly expecting Him to come. And not only are they looking for Him, they are longing for Him. John said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Let me ask you, are you... Are you watching with anticipation for the Lord Jesus Christ to come in the clouds of heaven? These people in the first century, they lived a spiritual life of alertness as if Jesus could come back at any moment. And when we talk about spiritual alertness, we're talking about being ready. We're talking about being prepared. Like the five wise virgins in Matthew chapter 25 as opposed to the five foolish virgins. Like Noah in the days of Noah, you know the coming of the Son of Man is going to be like in the days of Noah. And what was Noah doing before the flood came? He was building an ark. By faith, he was doing what God had instructed him to do every day. He obeyed God completely until that ark was built. And Hebrews chapter 11 says, By faith, he built it to the saving of his house. Are you watching for your house? Are you building by faith? Are you obeying God? Are you following uh, the instructions of his word in order for you to, to make application of, of this you need to ask some questions so let me just ask a couple very quickly what would need to change in your life for you to be ready for Jesus to come tonight maybe you haven't obeyed the gospel and tonight what you would need to do to be ready for Jesus to come would be to be baptized into him <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> have your, your sins cleansed by the washing of His blood or maybe for you it's uh, some sin that you have allowed to go unchallenged in your life I don't know what it is I know I've done that allowed sin to go unchecked friend that's no way to approach the coming of the Lord that's no way for the children of light to live we're to walk in the light as if though we know that the Lord's coming. Maybe it's a broken relationship that needs to be mended or something else. Maybe you've been waiting to serve the Lord. You've been saying someday, someday I'll do something for the Lord. Someday I'll do something for His cause. I could do this. I could do that. And someday I will. Well, friend, there may not be a someday if the Lord comes tonight. Amen. Someone told me about a congregation uh, this is very interesting. I am going to quit on time. Uh, somehow. Um, about a congregation that at the end of the service, the elders, one of the elders would say, Maranatha. Uh, and I, I got to thinking about that because in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, uh, it says, Our Lord comes or is coming. That's what that means literally in the Greek. And one of the elders in this congregation would say that at the end of... Uh, Maybe, Kenny, we could do this. Uh, sometime we'd say, Maranatha, and the men would repeat, and it could be today. Our Lord could come today. 